A lot of good uh, tweeting going on this week. Uh, I have a couple in mind uh, to talk about. So just to remind everyone, if you want to talk, then uh, raise your hand and I'll bring you up on stage. If you, if you <clears throat> have a bad connection or noise in the background or you leave your mic on and you don't realize that it's on, I'll move you off. And then you can just figure it out and <clears throat> come right back. Uh, raise your hand when you're ready and come back. Just know that you got booted off because of one of those ideas. I mean, if you start talking like crazy anti-trend stuff, who knows what can happen. Wow. So anyways, to start it off, I wanted to um, throw out a topic that people might be interested in. And it was something that uh, Richard was tweeting uh, with someone else about. It concerns stock trading and trading stocks versus trading indices. So as part of your diversified portfolio of currencies, commodities, interest rates, then um, we also want to trade stocks. And most CTAs trade stock indices, long and short. And I trade the stock, the single stocks versus the indices. So, um, you know, Richard and people have said many times that, you know, these indices, they kind of uh, don't allow as much of an outlier move possibility as a single name. And um, CTAs are sort of obsessed with trading lots of commodities and currencies and uh, interest rates. And they should be just as, as obsessed trading uh, individual stocks as well and creating your own portfolio of uh, equities to trade and not uh, defaulting to whatever the is contained in the indexes, uh, using your own money management system, your ATR trade sizing uh, to decide how big to trade a stock, not cap weighted, applying your own system to each individual stock versus kind of a basket of stocks that has never made a lot of sense to me. The integrity of that, <clears throat> you know, if I added all my energies together and traded that as a basket, uh, that wouldn't appeal to me for obvious reasons. So anyways, the, uh, the tweet, though, that I wanted to mention was talking about how much research it would take to trade single stocks and running this back test and figuring out which stocks to trade. <clears throat> and so just counter to that, I would say that I didn't do it that way. So just like all of the markets in um, the commodities, I just trade them all, right? <clears throat> and... Uh, I pay attention, a bit of attention to the correlation, but I trade all the commodities as long as they're liquid. Okay, so we can't trade, we can't trade all the indexes or the major indexes, 20 or whatever, 30 of those, but there's thousands of these equities, so we just can't trade them all. So I just went about this in the, in the same logical way as I just said to myself, irrespective of any back test or optimization, I'm going to choose 20 stocks that are basically... Uh, as less correlated as possible. So maybe I'll do some common sense and take one from each of the major sectors or I'll uh, do some correlation analysis and try to get some stocks that uh, in my portfolio that are not that correlated to each other. So I'm being very vague and very imprecise about this because this is the way I do it and this is the way I do all the other markets. <clears throat> um, I don't run some back test to see if I'm going to trade the Euro and the Swiss yeah, they're sort of correlated. I trade them both. So, and then I've started a new project where some of the markets that I'm interested in, I read about um, things like uh, lithium, uranium, cobalt, steel, coal. Okay, so maybe I'll go out shipping. You know, shipping's had a big run up and I haven't been able to participate in that. So I go out and I find some shipping companies and I see if it's sort of correlated to the shipping index. And I say, okay, I'll throw that in there but I'm just choosing these stocks like I choose the other markets. They're liquid, they add diversification, they're in. Um, I've just got to stop at 20 or 30 versus trading all the softs or all the meats or all the energy, right? So I don't do a big back test. I don't try to fine tune it too much. I just know, get away from the index and just choose some stocks and live with it and get lucky. Maybe you'll get Tesla, maybe you'll get Moderna, Maybe you won't. I had a lot of stocks this year that didn't do anything. They were so uncorrelated to the S&P that I was glad, but yet not making as much money as if I would have actually been in the S&P. 
All right, sorry for that long-winded approach, but uh, we'll bring some other people up and let them um, chime in as well. G'day, Jerry. Hello, everyone. Jerry, I like those ideas you were, you were saying. Um, look, I, I, I tend to sort of um, do a fair bit of analysis with, with, with my process, but um, uh, the, the logic that was expressed in what you were talking about, looking for these uncorrelated um, sectors within the, indus, indus, uh, within the stocks, um, I, I very much like that. And um, look, I, 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 the only reason that I would use data analysis is effectively to confirm that suspicion that, that you've been sort of identifying in your logical approach. So, um, no, it's, it's a good idea. And I, I do tend to um, feel that um, when we're trading these individual markets as opposed to collective um, aggregates of these markets, we, we do tend to get um, a better expression of nonlinearity because, you know, as, as we, we, we trade an ensemble like an ETF or, or an index, um, there's many factors in there which are sort of diluting that nonlinearity, um, either by the method of aggregation into the indices or, or the ETFs themselves, where we're bundling up um, a whole range of different markets that don't necessarily express those qualities that we're looking for. Um, that naturally dilutes that effect. So, no, I, I tend to really like your ideas. My litmus, test, my litmus test for some of this is always, um, am I handling everything the same? You know, is my rule the same? You know, do I have a special rule for stocks? Ooh, I, then I got to get rid of that special rule. I don't like that. I can trade, I can handle my stock exposure, my stock uh, weightings in my portfolio the same way that, the same philosophy that I would with the currencies. And, uh, but... I feel like over the years I have been bombarded with traditional uh, money management and stock trading uh, and all that stuff, watching Wall Street Week, you know, as a 20-year-old. And this bias and this, these different rules for stocks creeps into our, our brain. I remember coming up, you know, being so obsessed with um, trend following a large, diverse portfolio. I mean, this has been my obsession so maybe I don't change my systems enough. They're not fancy, but boy, have I focused on adding markets. And I remember thinking, well, of course, stocks is the next um, obvious thing to do. And 20 years, 30 years ago, when I started thinking about adding stocks, I would ask fellow trend followers, well, I'm going to trade stocks. And they said, okay, that's cool. And that sounds reasonable. But if I did that, I would not do trend following only. You know, there's so much more information. Uh, there's so many other ways to fine tune that portfolio. And, you know, um, we've just inundated and we're conditioned to believe, yes, you have to use other, maybe it's numbers, whatever, but, you know, not trend following only. And I was aghast. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm going to use trend following only, price only, go short, same systems. I don't care if you can do some analysis and s that shows stocks are different, uptrends are different, shorts are different, I don't care about that stuff. It's the same. I'm not going to get into this idea of treating certain markets and, and, and succumb to pressure from what is so obvious in the way everyone else thinks about these markets. I'm going to make stocks fit me. I'm not going to fit into the stock world. Uh, I hi to everyone. Uh, very happy to be here as always. And I want uh, to say that um, I totally agree with the uh, uh, point of Jerry and Richard that it must be individual, or oh, not individual, it must be the same approach to all the stocks here. But I want to mention that. Um, so we must remember that uh, stocks, yes, of course we must uh, choose, I do so, I choose stocks that are uh, mostly uncorrelated, but it's uh, to trade only the stocks, we must remember that to trade only the stocks, it's not the case, <laughs> and I know it from Jerry and from Moritz and from uh, Niels, uh, first of all, that um, when something wrong with uh, the market, when we have this extreme events, extreme environment, uh, the stocks, all stocks, almost all stocks, I think, become very high correlated and they go to zero. And 
I want to maybe of course it's another topic but it's very important and I'm very thankful Jerry Niels and Maurice for this very very important not to forget about being fully diversified not to trade only financials and to trade commodities markets as much as possible because some people especially young traders or not only young traders think that that when if they diversificate in a stock market space they are fully diversified and it's a own point <laughs> sorry jerry just caught the uh, tail end of that of your um of your comments you just so I'm not misunderstanding something, but are you then essentially saying that even if you had the data that shows that stocks do behave differently than, say, futures, you would still trade them the same way because of the core concept of trends following? Yes. I mean, I would trade them the same way. And, you know, there, just, uh, there has been something called... Um, single stock futures so the futures piece of that is is um it's really more like uh, stocks uh, i would trade stocks the same way i would trade commodities currencies and interest rates so yes because it's the sample size issue you know uh, jerry's a, a very he's always going to default to this this dumb sample size thing every single time every answer to every question for jerry is sample size well that's my first concern right so I feel like that if you divvy up uh, the currencies and let's optimize the currencies, well, they look a little bit different than the other three sectors. And then let's do the commodities or even better, let's hone in on energy. Yes, they're all going to look a little bit different. You can come up with something, some characteristic you think you see and you see it. It's just that we get the power of reliability and robustness by treating them all the same and kind of assuming that over the next 100 years, we'll see this performance all come uh, be very similar. Um, and we sort of don't have a, a choice if we're going to focus on the sample size to sort of assume that, that they're that trading them all the same way and covering up the name of the market on the chart and just doing the exact same breakout or moving average type system, that that's going to give us as good as anything uh, we can do in the future. It's, you know, the back test, I respect that, but I think I have a big limit on what I'm going to believe from that back test. Uh, no, I, I'll just add that um, your, your question was if you had the, the, the information that stocks are different, but that's a huge if. And I, 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 I'd say that yes, if we knew that they are different, if we knew how they are different, um, I probably would trade differently. but. And I think this comes down to a, almost to a philosophical question: is is that how much sample size do you need to 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 state to uh, to, to verify if this statement in, is is true? And I I, I believe we I, I I for myself could uh, I think I, I would never have a sample size big enough to to say that oh stocks are different stocks have been different and will be different from from currencies or from or from commodities um yeah no those are fair points i think based on my research and some of the research that i've read um there is evidence and i'm obviously open to you know perhaps i did something wrong in my research or some of the other uh, you know people that, that i've been following did something wrong to to you know miss a point, but there is evidence uh, or the data does show that equities do behave slightly differently in the sense that mean reversion is more prevalent in them, uh, which is why you kind of see a lot of mean reversion traders in equities specifically doing okay and doing quite well for many many years, um, and, and and they have pretty strong track records of that. The other thing as well is the, the noise factor. There does seem to be a case for wider stocks in equities if you are to trend follow. Now, once again, you know, I completely agree, Jerry, there that once you start getting into the nitty gritty and you want to optimize for every single market, for every single, you know, sector, whatever, you, you kind of get into trouble there. But there are certain, I guess, characteristics that would be worth paying attention to. 
Now, this is something that I've struggled with in terms of paying attention. Does that mean necessarily that you adjust and have, you know, specific systems? I, I don't know. I'm not ready to go there just yet. But the data does show that equities do behave slightly different than just, you know, your simple channel breakouts you would see quite effective in future markets. Yes, I, I'm sure. I, um, and Bruno corrected me in, in, in that. I just assume that the evidence that we were talking about, if, if you had the evidence that that was a, a back test, but if it was like um, something outside of a back test, like um, time travel, then yeah. And I do think though that how much, you know, with these systems, according to people smarter than me, with these non-normal systems, non-normal distribution with the outliers, the sample size requirement is, is even greater. And then let's say we came to a conclusion that X was, the prop, was, the, was sufficient sample size. I mean, I'm so conservative, I would do 2X and I'd want 2X. Okay, good for you, good for y'all. Y'all figured it out with this formula that now we have enough sample size. Um, but I do know some very smart people who I think are basically the greatest traders in the world have recently come out and said, well, we have extra commodity data now. That's enough for us to trade the commodities differently. So I was pretty surprised by that. So I'm not going to get into an argument with them, of course, or, any, or anybody else. I'm sort of just saying this is the way that I do it. And I love this idea that the stock's like the wider stops. I mean, I love wider stops. So I trade, you know, I allow in the back test the stocks to influence the systems I choose, like I do the other markets. And maybe the stocks have uh, pushed me to trade commodities with wider stops. I love that. I mean, I think uh, the, the longer term, the better that I can sort of justify by the back test. So <clears throat> that's perfect for my strategy to to trade these stocks um, longer term. And one of the things that I've noticed, and of course this is a small sample size of just the past few years, but my biggest trades the past few years are the, the stocks. So it's not just mean reversion or wider stops, it's like we're hunting for these outliers again. Do stocks create, uh, are they, can they hold their own as it relates to uh, producing outliers. I mean, just a cursory glance at the charts, and you're like, there's no better uh, market we've traded in 20 years in stocks. They've had the biggest trends. Even the stupid indices have trended really well. And then I got a hold of Tesla and Moderna. And as I've said previously, those were a monster trades, bigger than any other, um, you know, we've talked about the commodities this year. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I guess the commodities, they have moved a lot and we've made a lot of money in commodities, but none of them have moved as far as Moderna and Tesla and, and you know, still Bitcoin in there as well. And a great reason for Moderna, for instance, having such a gigantic move was because of the entry ATR. The ATR was so low. So that needs to figure into our analysis. When we look at the stocks from a trend finding perspective, here's a good question. Do stocks have unbelievably low ATRs when you get into them? And then as the market trends over the next year or two, these ATRs start to get very large. And as, as this trend proceeds, that's what's happened with Moderna. So as a percentage move, maybe Moderna hasn't done any more than <clears throat> excuse me, soybeans or bean oil. But it's that entry in, I'm sorry, that entry ATR that um, also plays a huge role in determining, you know, the profitability of stocks, which are going to be determined by these big outliers. Thanks, Jerry, for bringing up this topic, which, strange enough, is something I, I wanted to um, to hear more about from you. Um, just on this very subject, uh, could you tell us a bit more how you go about finding these, these gems and these pearls. Um, it, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to you know, broaden up your horizon and, and look for sample size. So you look at as many markets as possible, so irrespective of what uh, you know, traditional diversification would, uh, um, would maybe suggest. But also, how, how do you, you know, select Moderna 
from uh, uh, a, a peer? Or how do you just decide to go, you know, the time that today is right to go into Bitcoin or you know, uranium, all these other things that you're looking at? Other, you know, considerations that uh, um, sort of follow some systematic approach? Or is it something that, you know, where sort of you add your own value and is very much a personal uh, you know, portfolio manager's choice and uh, that's, that's how it goes. Go ahead, Mike. In, in addition to Bruno's question, uh, is there a selection criteria for, for stocks? Um, do you look at certain criteria to choose the universe of stocks? or uh, Because the universe is so wide. Do you, I mean, is there a, a selection criteria where you can filter down to... I mean, maybe you look at stocks above us, uh, which has a certain uh, ATR size before you, you choose them. And then for stocks, um, you're saying about the sample size, do you look at uh, counters which, have, which has a long history? Or how about counters that have just like recently IPO'd? Yeah, I think, um, so I'm not going to look at the, any sort of back test. That's for sure. I've got my system. I, it's been tested. I add markets when they come up, come, come on board. I don't re-optimize the parameters. So once again, I'm going to treat these stocks in the same way. I think that there is a lot of anxiety for trading single stocks for CTAs due to there being so many to choose from. It's like a relief to say, okay, there's 20 liquid indices. There's 20 different grain markets. I can just trade them all. I'll trade them all smaller if, than if there were 10. Okay, so this is like not stressful, but in, in asking, well, if I'm going to trade equities, how do I choose those equities? It's the fear of missing out on Moderna. You know, it's, the, it's um, all this anxiety. What if I don't choose the right ones? The liquid futures are chosen for me. I really like that. So you just need to get over that anxiety. You're not going to choose all the right ones. I, <clears throat> I choose them based upon liquidity and a correlation diversification measurement that's not part of any sort of back test. I'll throw the data in a spreadsheet and say, okay, how does Moderna play with uh, the S&P or how does it play with Tesla? And then, okay, they're not correlated. Okay, so now I have two. I'll take Moderna and Tesla. And honestly, if you have those two in your portfolio, it was luck. It's just total luck. But how about the ones I kicked out of the portfolio? Some of those were amazing as well. I missed out on some of those. I kept canopy growth. I kept beyond meat. So, um, okay, so now I have Tesla, Moderna, marijuana, and um, beyond meat. And so you can see a, a theme here. These are kind of different. And are they going to act similar at some points in times? They may, but I'm, I'm trying my best. You know, I'm trading cotton, coffee, cocoa, sugar, and juice. Okay, they're really diversified, but, but now they're all in uptrends. So maybe they're not that diversified all the time, but there's no anxiety for me deciding to trade the softs so, you know, give yourself a break, You choose 20 stocks, do the best you can, uh, but it's strictly 100% based upon the diversification. We're going to trade all the markets the same. We assume that the expectation per trade is the same for every market, for every trade. It's the average expectation of all the trades, the longs plus the shorts, the currencies, commodities, stocks, and bonds. So there is no reason to optimize or do anything different you especially if you're going to subtract these indices and add in single stocks that are going to be let's say 15 or 25 percent of your portfolio um, i remember the last big when i really tried to go out and find some amazing diversification in the equities two or three years ago i chose this and then my research team did the back this is not that great it's way worse than it was with our other list of stocks. And I was like, no, no, that's crazy. I'm not going to care about that. We add the markets to our trend following portfolio based upon two criteria, liquidity, diversification. And then we have no expectation what's going to happen in the future. Historical underperformance of a group of markets means nothing um, because it can always change. I mean, I had a horrible 10 years in commodities until 
late last year. And forgive, for, forgive me for um, keep asking because this is getting very interesting. Um, when when you talk about diversification, um, I understand there's there's no back tests, there's no sort of looking back. So you're just looking at how your stock plays with your existing portfolio, which makes a lot of sense. But do you have some sort of uh, uh, hierarchical structure uh, that you like to have in your portfolio, or is simply you know? sort of a covariance or something very, very simple where you just look at how one moves in relation to the other. And the other question I have is, with respect to liquidity, um, how do you go about and decide if something is liquid enough? So I presume you just uh, um, look at how much would be your position, your you know, 50 basis points of capital, uh, multiplied by however many ATRs you, you, um, your size of position by, and then, and then you look at that and say, okay, the, the market can fulfill this order, this you know, lot or two lots or whatever it is, without, uh, without particular problems. So you know, this is liquid enough for me. Is that how you do it? Or is it, again, a, a little bit more? To There's no more to it than that. I mean, but I trade orange juice, milk, rough rice, sunflower seeds. So it's difficult for me to, uh, for instance, get a hold of a, a sector in the stock market <clears throat> and not be able to find a few stocks that are at least as liquid as those really illiquid commodities I just mentioned. One of the things I'll do is I'll read, I'll read a lot, and I'll start writing down and doing research on different sectors, like, um, like I've already mentioned, like coal, steel, cobalt, lithium, uranium, <clears throat> crypt, uh, blockchain, and used cars. I've, so I'll go out and try to find like an ETF. Uh, of used cars or an ETF of uranium uh, or this shipping index. I was obsessed with this Baltic shipping, and I can't figure out how I can trade it. I think it's maybe European-based more so or over-the-counter. And then there is an ETF for this Baltic uh, futures shipping contracts, but they charge 3%. So... Anyways, I just used, I didn't do it, <clears throat> I wish I would have, and just sucked it up and paid the 3%. But usually I go and I just use, I go and look at the holdings of these ETFs, the uranium ETF. What are these, what, what stocks are in there? And then I'll choose from, you know, that group. And there'll be lots of stocks in there. And I can choose one or two that might be, looks like they're sort of correlated with uranium prices. Um, and, you know, there'll be at least one or two in there that are really liquid. So it's really not so much of an issue. Um, but I, I think, once again, stress, how do you choose, you know, to trade cocoa or sugar? It's not that correlated with anything else. Then that's the way you're going to choose your stocks. Um, but once again, there's so many. What if I choose the wrong ones? What if they underperform the S&P? But with, with systematic CTA trend following, we're trying to find stocks that will underperform the S&P. We know Microsoft, the FANG stocks, we know that they're probably going to lead the way up and lead the way down. My job as a risk manager is to go out and find some stocks that possibly when the S&P is hitting an all-time high, I'm short something, right? I'm short Canopy or Beyond Meat or Peloton, things like that, which actually did start to happen, you know. I didn't do as well on the upside, but this is only in hindsight do we know that we should load up on stocks that are going to go up. I am short some currencies now, the European currencies and yen, and long Mexico, Russia, India, Israel, South, A South Africa, and Brazil. I'm happy. I got a really diversified portfolio here. I'm following my system. You know, I hope we get a big currency move one way or the other. I hope one of the currencies really takes off and does something uh, big. But, you know, on a daily basis, I'm, I wish I had some short, uh, I'm short soybean meal. That's like the only grain I'm short. So I have a lot of risk in those, in those long grain positions. So I look forward to being able to find diversification that will, and over short periods of time, may cause me to underperform because first and foremost, I'm managing risk and trying to stay alive while we're hunting.
Uh, I want to say that I like uh, the idea of treating all the markets the same, that if I would have a theoretical opportunity to make money from weather chart, I would treat it the same like uh, the charts of uh, commodities or euro USD or something or, or like all charts because I'm sure like I said before that there are s some general laws of nature and because of these laws trend following exists uh, <clears throat> And if we see a chart of weather, for example, uh, we can see, uh, for example, in spring, uh, plus 8 degree by Celsius, plus tw 12, plus 8, plus 12, plus, plus 6, plus uh, 10. And after that, in May, it, it is plus 30 degree. So we see the same laws. Jerry, do you find that the research houses treat you differently? From being a CTA because you're doing a lot of direct stocks in your your portfolio. Well, I'm not doing a lot. I'm uh, probably allocating 15, 20 percent of my portfolio to stocks. But I definitely think that that's not welcome, uh, and has and uh, and so I've been doing it for 20 or 30 years. So, yeah, we would always get pushback. Please don't trade the single stocks for our account. You're a CTA. CTA trades indices. Go with the flow. Fall target. <laughs> Fall. Can you just please be normal and be like everyone else and don't trade these? But I'm like, it's better. It's better for you, me, the client. Let's, let's don't do these things. And I'm different. You know, Embrace my differentness. Put me in there with the, all the other CTAs who don't trade single stocks. But... It really is a, a, a black mark on the industry because where would CTAs be now if they had a great allocation to s equities, if they traded single names, um, their reputation, their AUM would be so much better, uh, the performance would be better uh, ver versus being kind of pigeonholed into this is what CTAs do. I've told a story that I, one time I had this one client very sophisticated, very large, and I asked them, could I trade single stocks? They said, no, you're a futures trader. And then a few years later, single stock futures came out, and I said, can I trade single stock futures? They said, yes, you're a futures trader. I mean, it's so dumb, you know? You, we trade these instruments, we're looking for liquidity and for diversification for these outliers, and yet people running businesses and selling things to clients, they don't want to that don't always embrace improvements that you're trying to make that, you know, it's a little bit of a hassle to set up your firm to be able to trade equities and set up your fund or your fund to fund to trade equities. I mean, some of these firms may have equity funds and global macro traders, and then they also have the CTA department, and you're going to get thrown in the CTA department. You, it was like impossible for us to get out of that. It was just so frustrating that we couldn't um, people did not put clients and performance first this futures trader uh, take is, is a funny one um, on this on this topic that and, and Richard uh, touched on it uh, in the very call and I think this the the, the advantage of trading um, single stocks instead of instead of a, instead of an index it, it works like this on, on my mind. Um, you can, okay, okay. I'll, I'll try uh, the the of of gambling. I don't know. Suppose you have uh, ten six sided dice, and if if you if you um, if, if it comes uh, uh, number one, you you lose money, and if it comes an, any other number, you you win it. So, from from a portfolio uh, point of view, it it makes sense if if you could take the average of these dice and earn only the average of them because it's extremely hard to all of them come one. So your average will be will be will be will will uh, equal a loss. But when you put some kind of 
stops on it or, or some mechanism to avoid uh, uh, a part, um, uh, a segment of this, of this spectrum of results, uh, then it makes a lot of sense to, to get each dice individually. Does that, does that make sense? I, I think my English is failing me right now. Usually I like these kinds of questions um, when, you, when simplified into games, but I didn't really get it. So you're saying that um, in a portfolio where we roll one is a loser, everything, you know, say two through six is, is a winner, um, then it's better to have the individual because you have a, a stop. But I, I, I don't get that part of the, the question. Yeah, my, my point is, if, if we have some way to avoid the ones, and in my mind, the, uh, our, our stops in our systems work just like that, then we, we can afford to, to play each individual dice. That, that would be to, to play, um, to, to trade individual stocks. Whereas if, if we don't have this, this, um, this tool to, to shift the skew of the, of the distribution, and then, we will, then a, a, an index uh, that take the average of the dice would be better. All I'm saying is because we have stops and because we have uh, mechanisms to avoid bad outcomes, it makes perfect sense to trade individual stocks instead of an index that would average the, the results of, of these uh, stock, of, of the component stocks. I hear you, Bruno. I know, I know what you're talking about. So with trend following, so there, there's a, a distribution of market returns produced by each instrument, whether they're stocks, futures, or whatever. With our systems, however, we apply these system constraints in there that prevent us from moving over to that left tail. So our distributions, our trade distributions are typically positively skewed, but they're only positively skewed when we're catching these outliers. Um, otherwise, the, the, the sample of our trade distributions when we are not catching these outliers are inherently, well, they do still have this, um, they cut off the left tails, but they don't get the benefit of that, that strong positive skew. So I, I see where you're coming from. And, and, and trend followers can afford to be less, um, less concerned with correlations. They can afford to actually trade sort of slightly more correlated markets and say a, 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 a systematic trader who doesn't apply the, the trend following recipe that cuts losses short. So in buy and hold, for instance, um, they get what the market delivers and they therefore, um, all of the benefits they get from it, the, the, uh, the right tails are taken away by the left tails yeah, exactly. when those markets turn negative. So um, with our systematic approach, we apply these constraints in there that prevent us from wandering too far over to that left tail exposure. So that, that's what you're talking about. We can afford to therefore play more dice or more correlated instruments um, to capture um, positive skew that exists in them um, because our systems themselves cut those um, that adverse tail exposure off from them. Richard reads my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly my point. Uh, if, if, we, if we didn't had, uh, if we didn't have the, the, the stops, uh, uh, a losing trade would be costly. And, and for those that don't have stops, to rely on the on the index makes sense, but for us that that do, we, we don't need this index. We can uh, uh, completely um, take advantage of the of the of the eventual six that will come in in the in in our playing dice. That's right, and then the integrity of the systematic approach that we have that's been properly back tested. Part of that is the money management and the sizing. How much Moderna did I have in an index that's calculated for me that's based upon cap weighted? It had nothing to do with Moderna's volatility or its ATR, which when I put it on, it was 87 cents. I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? So I put on Moderna at 87 cents because that was the ATR. I put on corn the same day, for instance, at you know whatever the ATR was for corn was. And so... 
just the whole integrity of the process of not using that for stocks, not applying my parameters, my system, my breakouts to each individual market, it just doesn't sound legit to me, irrespective of the outliers, you know, even if it, uh, it's partly the outlier, but it just, you know, no CTA would trade the dollar index for many reasons or a commodity index and not trade each individual commodity. They're wonderful. They're beautiful. They're matter diversification one would get. And yet, CTAs trade stock indices. So let's get busy. That's what we do. Uh, but I want to say, say that uh, trading commodity index is a rather stupid thing because it's very uncorrelated return stream and um, to make a basket of uncorrelated return streams is, um, I think it looks strange uh, to trade commodity index. It's a very, very bad idea, I think. I'm thinking about this in uh, transformation, right? So um, when we put the basket together, it reduces the overall volatility of this portfolio. We can all agree on that, and that's why you wouldn't trade the dollar index except for all of the um, underlying currencies, the same with any commodities or um, equities. Um, we like that additional volatility that uh, comes from the underlying instruments. And the reason that is is because the stop loss transforms the returns. And if you are cutting off those tails, you can even assume it's a coin flip, uh, you know, up or down. If you have more or less volatility, we will force a capture, up capture, and we will reduce down capture. So having something that will be more volatile, um, given the transform of stop losses, will help all of the systems. And the reduction from diversification will make it a lot harder for you to, um, say, move up your stop or to get uh, the end return uh, distribution is large um, on both wings. But since we truncate the um, left wing, uh, then it's beneficial. That's how I'm kind of putting this together. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Derek. And I would say that uh, uh, does it compare to trading? Um, an index that's less than the than their individual components, and then you can simply trade it trade it larger. Um, but the the my answer to this question would be well that's that's nuts. You don't know how 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 low it can go on um, on. A, whereas if you have stops, you well not perfectly, but you have a a a, a pretty decent. Uh, view of how bad it can go. I, I think um, talking about the after transform, as in after you've put all of these instruments um, into your strategy that uses some kind of stop loss, trailing stop loss, um, then you are offloading this volatility risk and onboarding correlation risk. And I think that that gets back, I want to, it comes full circle, right? Um, I think specifically with equities, you know, they do become correlated in downturns and you will be taking multiple stops. And then that goes back to what Jerry was saying. You could just trade them all smaller. Are you trying to do the sector um, allocation or creating your portfolio with these correlations in mind? And I do think that ends up with you um, also benefiting because, I mean, lately things have been, you know, running up quite well in, in, in the pharmaceuticals or whatever. I, I mean, I'm not an equities guy, but I could see that also working in your benefit and you really are taking the benefit of the direction of your trend a lot more than the other side. Um, but I'm not sure if that would blow up your risk, like a cumulative 10 losses in all of your equities at one point versus um, a larger position in the uh, equity indices that you were trading um, how that would work out, what's the, the ratio there of, of risk-reward. So that's another, another thing I just thought of, thanks to Derek, was there is this uh, entry, um, the benefit of trading the, lots of different markets in, in all the sectors, including stocks, is the entry dates. You know, the dates will not all line up so well. Um, Although the, it does seem that the entries on my, when I look at the stock indices, they do line up closer. So I'm 
sporad I'm, I'm piecing in my exposure to stocks. I'm piecing out my exposure to stocks. Because sometimes when they, they crash, they go back up. You know, we've seen that. So just, but it seems that when I look at the European indices and the U.S. indices, there is more correlation there that I'm not seeing, let's say, from an entry point of view. Um, so, okay, so then we, we, <clears throat> we have multiple different entry dates come February 2020. We have multiple, they're all mostly profitable trades, but they, um, different levels of profitability in all the different stocks that were long. And I remember sitting there and just being horrified at this massive sell-off, right? And I was like, what the heck? You know, I thought I had diversification. I'm trading stocks too large. I'm really mad about this. And I overstated the correlation that I was could expect from equities, even though I lived a long life and I've seen you know, these sell-offs and this correlation going to one. And then it stops going to one and then they rebound and, you know, things get different again. Still, it's very painful. So, but then I look around and I say, oh, crap, uh, the currencies are going down and all the commodities are going down. And like everything's going down. So really, that's not an excuse, but it's not a reason to indict the stocks either and to really say that that's the problem, that I traded too many stocks or you can't expect this diversification. You're not going to get it from the indices either. But it was what happens when, you, when uh, we build these portfolios on this back test that um, shows us how great diversification is, but then it goes away. And that is a situation where we need to have other rules. We, ha we have to make sure that our overall risk level, three units, four units, five units, look, choose how, what your overall maximum risk can be. And if you're unhappy with it, then cut it back. Um, but in the middle of a bad period, it's a little too late to sit there and say, oh, I should trade smaller. Yeah, if that's going to bother you, and you know, correct that. But then we need to have you know, this overriding rule you know, that allows us possibly, this was another subject we could get into too. Jacob brought this up of maybe not being 100% rules-based or sticking to the systems 100% of the time because maybe we need to have a rule or an idea that like mine or like I have, which is when all hell breaks loose, abandon your rules and reduce your leverage, reduce your positions if it's all going to one. And I think this is not the perfect solution, but it is a good solution. You know, we're in a situation where diversification works and we should embrace it. The systems work, the stop losses work but not all the time. And especially for me, if I'm taking small losses, I'm very concerned with that. I'm stringing together lots of small losses. But like in last February, I was up 10%. The markets crashed. Then I was break even. Okay, I'm, you, know, you know me. I'm going to have a little different attitude about that. It's unfortunate. I don't like it, but I'm not losing money. It's, so I'm going to make the distinction between many different stop losses being hit and losing money and eating away at my capital or, you know, I'm making good money and now I'm not making as much as I was, but I'm still making money. Um, and I think about how we can understand, maybe it's a not very clever question, but how we can understand early that it's this environment become extreme in the early stage of crisis. Well, that's a billion or trillion dollar question. Um, as far as I know, it's pretty darn impossible. And, uh, you know, was, uh, um, I was quite reprimanded in my comment the other week about, uh, um, you know, having to hedge when you need it the most. It's, it's that timing element that is really elusive. Um, there are, in, 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 you know, in the industry, there are you know, re regime switching models um, you know, uh, all sorts of all sorts of techniques, but it's, they are very very difficult to uh, to, to to point out and uh, to, to, to to calibrate and make make work. So you know, it's uh, once again Jerry's approach. Jerry's uh, you know, um, pragmatism pays dividends, but you know the question is, can you systematically 
if the question is can you systematically you know time your your hedging i think the answer is is more likely to be no than yes certainly in my experience and it's very frustrating so, at least. i want also to say that when I see something new in the market uh, in terms of volatility, um, uh, extremely big moves maybe, and there is a situation when I must uh, enter by my uh, enter signal, uh, I don't uh, use uh, ATR stop loss in a new environment if it's only a few days environment. I use it more than it was but uh, not uh, uh, for example it's uh, uh, three at air or two and a half at air uh, but um, a little bit maybe on 30 percent more than it was but not in 100 new at air uh, it's not i think i uh, it's not clear i'm not very clear in describing this but uh, I think it's not very good idea uh, to trade um, in a new environment rules if this new environment started only a few days ago because we don't know the, what is going on. It's my personal opinion. But my question was regarding using futures CFDs, they're highly leveraged instruments. So the amount of risk that you need to put on to get the exposure is quite manageable. Do you get that same exposure when you're going into the single stocks? And, and how are you doing it? Are you taking additional margin to, to boost that leverage? So it's it, maybe I have a unique situation, but by the so without trading stocks, let's say my margin to equity is my margin is going to be pretty low. It's going to be maybe 10, 15, 20%. So I'm putting 80% of my cash somewhere else earning interest. So, and I'm only trading. So then I add single stocks in and replace the, my indices. So I'm still going to keep that 15 or 20% of my portfolio with stocks. So I'm not trading too many stocks. The future is. Um, I, can, I have a large amount of cash left over f from trading the futures, and I can apply that cash to the equities depending upon my number of positions. Like, I don't have a lot of positions now. I have some longs and shorts, but I don't, I'm not um, fully long everything. So I'm not even borrowing money. I, and plus, I can borrow money in the same way that futures finances my commodity trades. I can borrow money from the broker if necessary to finance my stock trades but i haven't had to do that but you know once again that's dependent upon my maximum risk the amount of risk i have in stocks my allocation to equities the stocks that i have um, i'm basing the stock positions off the atr and not the price of the stock so some stocks I have big positions on because the ATR was low and some I have small positions on. So it works for me, um, but in the, within those constraints, if I was 50% equities or 75% equities, that would be, I think you get a pretty good bang for your buck ATR wise with the stocks. So I don't um, have to have big stock positions to, to have what I consider to be a proper I'm not stop I'm not obsessed with these stocks I just want to for that 15 or 20 percent of my portfolio that I have rightfully allocated to stocks because they're not the same as currencies commodities and bonds it the the cash equities work fine for me single stock futures when they existed I traded those and I just got my financing from futures now I get my financing from cash it's like almost zero zero difference between the two. I want to go back to this um, correlation, I'll say cascade, um, and its effects on different markets. I mean, recently we've seen um, in the past few weeks where equities down, uh, bonds down, things like that, and being based in Asia and not 
necessarily being awake when um, a majority of moves happen in, in, in the US. Um, I've taken this type of research quite seriously because of um, how the liquidity moves quite quickly and risk off moves. And like we've said, um, it not only happens in um, equity, so to say, I mean, say like um, Nikkei down, Hong Kong down, um, uh, Euro stocks down, DAX down, then maybe maybe NASDAQ pulls up. I don't know. Sometimes it does crazy things, but uh, that type of um, chain reaction uh, that happens. And that has happened as well. Um, now we're starting to see that in the, in the um, kind of uh, government fixed income as the world has become extremely connected. These types of correlation moves in the distribution of liquidity happens quite quickly. But going on to Bruno's point, um, I have done some research uh, that does, I wouldn't, it, it's, it's kind of what Oleg said, like um, it wouldn't tell you exactly when to do stuff, but there does become periods where um, global systemic risk increases. I can't, I mean, you, you can find ways to see when these types of um, cascades will occur or when these types of um, when the markets become driven by certain elements or factors, so to say, and it helps. But you, I, I haven't implemented it into a way to adjust the leverage. I mean, I believe personally that your systems, um, if you were to do it, you would still need to put on the positions. I haven't gotten that far in it yet. Um, but it does give an indication so far um, that you can switch between a safe asset and a risky asset across multiple jurisdictions uh, using this. Um, to generate uh, better, I can't say returns, um, better performance. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I do think it's possible. So I think I heard most of that. I, oh, one thing caught my attention right at the end. My, so I'm not going to do that research and come to a conclusion. Like it's not in my head to say, I think you can do this and it's going to make things better. No. What makes things better, the only thing I'm always concerned with is following my rules. I don't want these things to make them better. By definition, if I have to trade smaller, f find a rule that helps me uh, not lose too much money when things uh, start crashing and going to one, um, I don't want to implement this rule very often. And so I want a sample, a very low sample size. I'm hoping that my leverage is good. I've set that correctly. My systems are great. My diversification continues to work. So I'm not even going to backtest this thing, this rule of cutting risk when something bad starts happening. Um, I don't want to do it. It's a non-system trade. If the backtest tells me it works well, I'm not going to ignore it. What works well is me doing those trades, following that system. And for the rest of my life, if I never have to utilize this cutback mechanism, uh, I'll be very happy. So, I'll, so I don't, I want to like go back and look in history and acknowledge yes, we have lots of diversification, great uh, cutting, cutting losses short, but every now and then it does look like every five or six or seven or two or three years, we do have, uh, we are betrayed by all of these different positions. There is no diversification then it looks like we can stay in the game and stay alive uh, by reducing our positions, let's say by half. And then as soon as things settle down, we're going to go right back to doing our system. It doesn't matter what the back test says. I have no uh, inclination to sort of uh, tweak, tweak a rule to, hey, you know, this actually adds value. Maybe, maybe it does. Maybe it has. But... I am wedded to these systems and hoping to never have to not do these system trades. And the good thing about the cutback rule, whatever your cutback rule is, um, it allows you to keep doing those trades. So, uh, and not guessing and not really using the level of discretion that says, okay, in February of last year, I won't do these currency trades or I will I won't do these bond trades. No, I'm just going to cut my risk. I can sleep at, sleep at night now and then computer keep doing the trades at half the risk. And at some point when things get back to normal or what I perceive to be normal, which is uh, not everything is going down or going up at the same time, I'll start adding this risk back to the portfolio. 
Um, and I, uh, I have an idea, and I think that um, most of you and Jerry and um, Richard will not like this, I think, but uh, idea for extreme events. Uh, if extreme events like Crisis 2020, for example, occurs, and I understand this, um, close all stock positions, all individual stocks, all stocks of the companies, and begin to trade uh, as uh, P uh, S and P 500 only index with less risk, uh, twice less risk, and only one. And uh, I think uh, I did not implement this, apply this, but I think that uh, uh, can it can help for me me, me personally to d uh, to be uh, not uh, so um, to avoid the panic maybe and uh, to be more disciplined um, uh, to understand the situation is un under control because I it's only one instrument not 20 or 30 and I'm talking about extreme events and when all goes to one I have this <laughs> idea. I want to touch back on what Jerry said. And um, I think the reason I did this research was because I felt that there was something happening in the markets, um, I, like the th this thesis I had uh, given before. The benefit to having this type of um, adaptive risk overlay would be that it's systematic. Um, you would be able to backtest it. You could implement it. I'm not saying that I have, but um, there it would follow those types of things. And yes, it would have a very low sample size, which is one of the major detractors. Although um, you could try in different countries to like up that or using different instruments to to up that. But I want to avoid the panic mode if you were to cut risk. Um, otherwise, I think you should just hold your, your risk all of the time. Um, it should have been predetermined what your, your, your portfolio is. It should have been predetermined what your risk per trade is. And even if you can't sleep at night, that's your problem. Like you should have done your back test. You should have done everything right. And that's controlling the human nature rather than doing that. But if you were to implement such a thing, it should have been in a systematic, back-tested way where you can get at least some kind of sample size and it works on multiple different markets and tries to follow the golden tenants uh, that we have here for trend followers. I really like that idea, Derek. And um, look, I, I do have an adaptive process. And the reason I do that is that um, I tend to think that the times that people make stress decisions are at the worst possible times. And it's a bit like um, you're too late to the party by the time you've got to make a decision. So you might be, you know, 40%, 50% in drawdown and you're suddenly thinking, oh gosh, it, it hasn't occurred before in my back test. I'm entering new territory. Let's cut my risk in half. But the way I apply an adaptive process is that I'm continuously each year replacing my models. But Using, using this sort of rolling window of about 10 years, it just progressively moves on so that if there's any adaptive nature in the market, even though I might not get it, um, you know, 100% right, my models slowly adapt. And I, I think, you know, when I examine other systems like natural systems and what makes a cockroach so hardy, um, you know, what, 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 um, what are the influences in natural selection that that make more robust species and other species. It's not that they've responded to change. It's just that um, they have these particular um, systematic qualities about them that make them robust in a new environment. And I tend to think that when we're trading these diversified systematic trend following portfolios, our entire population of systems and methods in our portfolio are, are our species, our species of collections. And to make decisions based on, you know, when, when you're in a drawdown, I, I don't think you should be making these post-reactionary decisions. I think you should be making decisions all the time so that you actually don't arrive at that situation where you're at a 50% drawdown. Your, 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 your systems should be try to adapt before that situation arrives. Um, and, and with a static overlay, if, if, 
if you adopt the static approach to trading these markets, I think that the adaptive nature of these markets ultimately catch up with you. So you do need some sort of progressive creep or adaption in your models to make ensure that all of your species and your population are, con are continually sort of, um, um, they're, they're robust all the time for not only long-term robustness, but also re more recent market conditions. Yeah, that's good stuff. It made me think of a couple of things. Um, you know, one at one time, I mean, I, I just definitely think that we need to be very obsessed with following the system. So that is the genius of a rule that says, hey, just reduce your positions for a while. Keep, and, and for the future, and then keep doing the system. You're able to keep, keep doing it at 50%, one-third, and then we'll get back to full leverage or full risk at a later time. I know one time I, it, the markets were so bad, I was getting crushed so bad that I don't recommend this, but I, this worked out well for me. I just said, look, we got so many positions on. We, we tried 100 markets. Then we're going to start this process of getting rid of half. I was just like, okay, let's go long a unit of bonds and short a unit of S&P. And then, because that's what's happening here. We're getting crushed uh, in the stock market. So just, so that's what we did. And um, it, it worked well. We made, we, we just kept trading our system, uh, but we had this long, long bond, short S&P trade on that was protecting us rather than going ahead and reducing positions. And I remember years later, the client did an audit of our performance and they called me up and said, hey, we did an audit. We see these two big trades you hit, you hit here where you made a lot of money on these trades, but what were you doing with these trades? This is kind of weird. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was my risk control because I, I, I want to get the risk down. I want to reduce it, but you want, still want to put yourself in a situation where you're not exercising guesswork or discretion or panic. Uh, you're continuing to do the systems at an appropriate level or take them all off and just relax for a while. I guess that's okay too. Um, but uh, just a cockroach thing, I, you know, there has, there was that one book I tweeted this recently and over the years, but it's, it is the, I think it's the demon of our own design by book stabber. And he talks about the cockroach and survival in this cockroach, the cockroach has been moderately successful over a long period of time. And I think that's what we want to do. We want to be you know, kind of moderately successful. Good is okay. It doesn't have to be great. Great in, uh, signifies some sort of optimization. And the cockroach, uh, according to scientists or whatever, he feels this slight breeze and he runs away. So he, he feels this little bit of pressure or a little bit of possible uh, problems in his life and he knows how to get away and survive and he's like frequently wrong like us like 60 percent of the time when we get out of these losing trades we're wrong we got to get right back in maybe in the same direction um and i think that's a pretty good book to read and i think trend following does have some more so of a cockroach than probably a turtle and then i tweeted this other article the other day that maybe I misinterpreted it or, you know, I, I exaggerate a lot, you know, to make a point. Uh, and I appreciate most people not calling me out on it too, too much, but it's okay if you need to, because, you know, I shouldn't exaggerate, but I did, uh, there was a study, I think done by Fidelity about traders, retail traders, and it was called like freak out and people freak out and they measured, they saw these people freaking out. And it was like a uh, part of the article was it's males, over 45, or, and they had these characteristics, you know, and um, the, her, the ones who are more prone to freak out. And that is that when a stock starts getting crushed, they get out. And the analysis that I read or interpreted was that the exits were fine. They were sort of doing a trend-following exit. Uh, the market's getting crushed. Maybe, you know, it's, it's like a, what I would consider a minor correction that we've seen in the stock market so far. And so maybe last week or this week, people were uh, freaking out and they, they sold. That wasn't the problem. That's sort of a trend following exit, maybe not disciplined, maybe not systematic, but still 
uh, it probably helped sometimes because the market kept going lower. But what really destroyed these people were they did not get back in. And that is the cardinal sin. The most important thing is getting back into that trade when this trend shows that it's, that it's justified because you cannot miss these outlier trades. That's where all the material money is. Uh, I think that it's very important here to have a rule, a very exact strong rule, when we are, it, at what point, uh, uh, under what circumstances we reduce our position and at what point we uh, get back and trade as we trade. It's very important to be rule based here. So have a rule for this emergency situation. Sorry, just uh, one point here. Um, maybe a little bit too late in the game, I guess, but what is everybody's definition of risk? Now, obviously there's the academic sense of risk in, in, you know, in, in the financial markets and so forth, but I think there's, there's different type of risks. And you know, on, on the topic of backtesting potentially, where you can kind of see you know, what the market has done and, and evaluating that risk, it, it, it becomes a little muddy for me at least. I mean, there's things like, you know, credit risk, counterparty risk, and emotional risk. I mean, that's, that's a big one too, right? If there's anything that can potentially compromise your emotional control and you start doing certain things, I mean, that to me as well is risk that isn't really talked about. So I just want to know what people's definition, when we say these things and when we throw out the term risk, what do they mean by that? It's a common confusion, risk and volatility, where I think risk is, the absolute loss where volatility is the short term up and down. Yes, I mean, I, I get that. I get that. I mean, necessarily, like, I mean, we draw down, I guess I would see it's a part of risk, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's entirely risk in itself by definition, but I definitely do understand where you're coming from. I guess when we're throwing out the term here with risk and, you know, managing risk and mitigating risk, I'm just kind of trying to see what people are actually talking about when they say that I, th I think most people when when talking about risk there's there's a trend followers version of what risk is versus what perhaps um other methods view risk and i sort of break down risk into that that can be quantified which is effectively known risk which um we, we might uh, use some methods such as, um, I don't like Sharp because that um, penalises upside volatility, but Sortino, those sort of things, um, uh, Ma, um, you know, based on a historic back test, we, we, we can define sort of risk as far as what, what certainty or what, what the known regime has, has provided us over uh, our back test. But then there's this uncertainty, which is this, new risk which which is yet to be appreciated which is what i think a trend follower is particularly concerned about and um that that's sort of um that risk lies in the tail exposure that occurs in markets which can't be predicted therefore it can't be quantified but we know it exists and therefore our models themselves must have some um, constraining mechanism to prevent us from ever venturing down that path where our losses become non-linear I, I think this, this this talk about linearity and non-linearity, I, I particularly think that our concern is with um, adverse non-linear risk because that's where we can get account blow-ups, um, our correlations can all go to one. Um, in, in these sort of particular extreme environments, there are certain certain situations that can arise which, which haven't occurred in the past, they're uncertain, but can occur. And just, just through the knowledge that they can occur, we need to mitigate for them. Yeah, I'd say that we, we're t most of the time when we say risk, we're talking about uh, risk of ruin, the risk of going broke, the risk of not being able to, to, to deploy your system, to follow your rules. Yeah, these are good points. I think, you know, I, I personally had a hard time just kind of running back tests and looking at the sharp and, and saying that, hey, you know, I've kind of handled my risk or you know, correlation risk and kind of considering all of that, there's, there's a different type of risk as well. I mean, you know, broker risk, um, especially brokers going out of business unexpectedly, things like that, you know, uh, counterparty risk and just emotional risk too. I know that's a little bit too touchy feely for potentially the systematic crowd, but I, I don't think you can avoid 
even on an institutional level, um, you know, the, this, this, this concept of, of having emotional control and sticking to your system and doing the right thing. I know that's what we all strive to do, but that is quite a fundamental aspect, at least for a retail personal trader. Um, so just wanted to kind of see what everybody's thoughts were on, on what it is when we refer to risk other, outside of just the standard, you know, metrics of risk that we see. And I want to say that uh, I like uh, the opinion of one person, I don't remember who is him, but I like this opinion that uh, one businessman he said that we can't avoid uh, risk, uh, we, we can't replace it, we only can minimize it and can control it. And um, um, it's a uh, few, few person, few businessmen and traders said that, uh, not one person, uh, had remembered. And so I like this point very much that so because some people. An investment field, especially and in the business field, they want to do something that will be without risk. The people are ready to invest money if they believe there is no risk at all, no drawdowns, only profit. Some people, a lot of people believe in this. Educated people, they believe there is no, there is a secret science of knowing the future of prediction. And there is no risk or uh, minimum risk, and they believe uh, three, four years track records, and uh, in fact they lose all their money. Uh, hello, this is Marcus. Uh, on the topic, I recently listened to Tom Basso, who uh, who told really well that he's attacking the risk, not trying to avoid it. So with long and shorts and diversified portfolio. He's attacking the risk. But uh, anyway, I have a question that I already had in my mind uh, last week. Uh, uh, Jerry often talks about making his clients happy. Uh, low uh, risk per trade, low margin, protecting the core capital, uh, diversifying everything. I was just wondering, what if you only had to make yourself happy. Let's say you had $1 million account, your own capital. Uh, maybe you were 30 years old, but uh, with the knowledge you have today. And uh, yeah, what, how, how would you approach risk differently? Like, would you be uh, more margin or uh, more risk per trade or more stocks, more maybe short term? Uh, what what uh, thoughts come up to your mind? I think that one of the fa failings of my being a good businessman was I didn't really, I just never really did things differently than what I thought was right. And I think uh, I would have been raised more money if I would have traded smaller. I didn't do that. I would have raised more money if I traded these ball target, all that sort of stuff. So I didn't do a good job of building a business because I just was kind of obsessed with, I don't know, trying to create the perfect trading program and then hoping eventually people would um, see that for what it's worth. And I think to sometimes, I guess, when I say do what's right, do what's best for the client, it's like, you know, um, you don't want to, when you go to the doctor, you don't want to hear, like, eat more broccoli, right? And so that's, I'm um, telling people to eat broccoli all the time. And they don't want to hear that. I'm being, in some respects, t thinking highly of the client by, uh, by the way I've designed my trading system and portfolio, but it doesn't mean they like it. Um, I mean, I don't want to give myself too much credit because I've made mistakes and, um, and some of the things that most of the things that large firms do, they do it very well. And they have those clients because they have figured out a really – a uh, good way to um, trade properly and, um, you know, realize the what their clients want and the limitations of clients. They're not traders, they're not trend followers, they're not, you know, whatever clients are systematic necessarily. And so it, you have to sort of take that into consideration. Um, I think that, back to the, the other question about what is risk, um, I liked all of those answers and I, I couldn't believe I didn't think of them all initially, but I guess I keep going back to this trend-following philosophy, let, let profits run, take small losses. So I don't think we need to do that. That 
I, I'm not a fan of cliches. They're frequently wrong. And, um, but I like this one and I, and I don't want to give up on it because not because it's, it's, it's been around a long time, but because I think it, it lets us off the hook. We have this amazing strategy that we don't have to pay attention to volatility. I don't want to really pay attention to any kind of volatility, um, Sortino or, or anything. I don't really care about the volatility. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I understand the drawdown. That is actually kind of painful. And I understand that maybe Sharp or Sortino or some of these volatility measures can portend a drawdown. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're coming in every day and your average return is plus or minus 5% like mine used to be, dude, you're in for some trouble here. It's a good warning sign. But, you know, we're having lots of great upside, downside volatility now. These outliers are going crazy. And sometimes they're up a lot. And the next day they're down a lot. It's a huge winning trade. We're doing the right thing. We're doing the best job we can possibly do or anyone can do at capturing these outliers. So stop. We're not going to get penalized for that. Open trade equity. Let profits run. Except, no, there is no except. We're going to vol target. No. We're going to scale back. We're going to penalize ourselves if we make, if we have an open trade that's 20% profit and we only end up making 10. No, we're not. So, I'm going to be obsessed with these small losses. I don't want to string a lot of them together. I need to be very careful about the small losses and the trading size. And is it 25 basis points per loss or 50 basis points? Because I have a 40% win rate. So vol targeting would require me to trade a bit bigger and risk more than 25 basis points in order to make the same amount of money. Of course it would. I'm taking smaller profits, which is okay. The system seemingly is more efficient. I can leverage that up. But hold on. I don't think that vol targeting is as robust as a simpler one entry, one exit, one stop loss system. So we're going to be leveraging up on a shakier, less robust system. So I'm very concerned about protecting this core capital. It goes by so many different names, closed equity, core capital. I forgot Richard's name for it, but it's simplistically, it's just this million dollar investment. I'm going to protect that million dollar because my philosophy of letting profits run, taking small losses, is I'm eating away at my million dollar investment with the small losses, but the big profits, letting the profits run, hopefully is going to pay for these small losses. So I'm very concerned about this million dollar account, this core capital, this closed trade equity. And as time goes forward in year two, uh, I will update them 1 million uh, for all realized profits, let's say. So now I'm up to 1.2 million. So I'm going to defend that level because now my losses are based on the new trade level. That is this realized initial investment plus realized profits and losses. So I'm defending this level, this core capital level that allows me to just let the open trade profits just go crazy. And I'm, I'm going to be disappointed when I'm giving back that profit. But, it's, but the drawdown on these open trades are profit related. They're not risk related. The risk is the small losses. Jerry, just regarding risk, uh, I know you mentioned that when the markets go crazy, um, you start to cut down on some of the positions or um, make them smaller, I guess, until things turn to normal. Would you consider that, that process of doing that, that discretionary process of quantifying or, I guess, determining what is normal versus not normal, is that risk, just in your opinion? Well, I'm kind of in favor of having a rule. Let me. See, I wrote something down when Derek was talking. It's um, yeah. I think it's good to have a rule, even though it's not going to have a lot of sample size. Like, I hope in the back test, my system is so good. I've chosen. The, I've got the. I've got it right in the beginning. The amount of risk and leverage that I want. My total max units. And I'm hoping the back test says, hey, you know, you're never, you never have a period where you're going to get freaked out and want to reduce, go against the system and reduce your positions. Um, 
but let's say that this does occur and I have a rule and not having, even though it has no sample size, I will, it's still a rule. I guess that's pretty good, even though it's not, you know, it's just this random rule I came up with. So, but I really liked what you said earlier, which is emotional risk. So let's just go back to February of last year where I said I was up 10% for the year and then I start losing all this money very quickly due to COVID reactions. And uh, let's say that I'm like break even for the year. Well, okay, but I thought you said that you only cared if you started losing money, you're still positive for the year or break even. Yeah, I had this emotional reaction, which um, in this emotional type situation where I was like, I'm losing money so fast. I don't really care if it's not eating into my core capital. Um, it's just a crazy world we live in with these moves and I need to get a handle on it and get a handle on reducing risk in my portfolio. So I feel like that that was a little bit of an emotional response. And um, I don't really know if it's always going to be a situation where I don't live through, you know, the next thing we have to live through it could be way worse. And so maybe the rules we come up with based upon my past 35 years, and especially last year, uh, won't do me well. And I'll have to say, oh my gosh, this is worse than COVID. So we need to cut back even, qu I feel like we should cut back quicker, you know, feel like. So I, I definitely believe in this, in this idea of following our system at all costs, trying to do everything we can to do that reducing risk so we can continue to follow it. But then we need to have a kill switch or a risk reduction switch that basically says, you know, I feel like this is one of those rare situations where survival is paramount. And I think overreacting sometimes is not the worst thing possible. But look, at some point in time, make up your mind, you got to get back in, things have settled down. Uh, and that's really the key. And that's, that's, what happened last year if you're able to pull the trigger on um and and i think at some point last year i my system runs my traders do the system and i think i just was in a funk and i was like i think the world is just going to go to zero and yet we were still doing the trades i think that's important to have a division of duties where you can be freaked out but you're paying people or you have a situation where someone you know is is more uh, independent and, and less subject to emotional risk and they're just doing their job uh, I want to say that um, uh, very uh, as I said before that trading uh, in the short term and especially intraday it's good only for training and I say this because it's proven by myself and so uh, when you have a short term trading background like me it's in fact you have every day stress every day your day is stressful every day is stressful if you train today <laughs> and, um, so it uh, makes more emotion uh, emotional uh, resistance it gives more emotional resistance so very good trading to trade intraday uh, and of course um, if we speak more maybe serious uh, it's very important to have a back test to have a sample size and uh, i have said before that i when i saw something extreme maybe big drawdowns long drawdowns I began to backtest. I began to do the research instead of doing something bad or something more risky or something inconsistent or discretionary on my account. Uh, instead of this, I began to do backtest. And also, I liked very much, and I have said this before, advice of Jerry to look at a weekly chart. To look at the weekly chart. Now I'm talking more about not extreme events, but when we are in the drawdowns, when we are in long, deep drawdowns. Uh, very good idea of Jerry. Jerry said this to look at the weekly chart and to see how it works in a long period of time. That in a long period of time. Uh, we will win if we handle this pr pressure of a drawdown. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, 
I'm fascinated on this this correlation, I guess, or you know, this, this blend of of emotion and how it drives you know the systems that you use, how you view risk, and what you do. I think you know sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking that there's systems and you know we back tested them and we've seen all these things and we have all these metrics without realizing how much of the emotions and and, and your opinions and your views they go into making these systems and, and testing certain things and, and believing certain things. And, and I seldom feel that that's discussed, at least at the systematic level. I mean, I know, especially in the hedge fund industry, you know, there, there's, there's just different ways and, and presentations and marketing material of how, you know, all risk is covered. But then you have people making very emotional decisions, which is backed by the data. Um, that could be to their own, you know, demise. So it, it, it's just this this relation between a relationship between emotions and emotional control and what you trade and how you trade. It doesn't seem to get the same amount of recognition or I guess exposure as it would in, let's say, the discretionary trading circle. So I, I just find that a bit interesting. Um, hence the question there too. One one of the interesting things that um, I find when talking about risk is that you know the reality is that as soon as you place a, a trade in the market, you are you you have a hundred percent exposure of risk. And actually, with leverage models, it can be much more than a hundred percent risk exposure. So we uh, there, there's a term which I like, which is this concept called warehouse risk, which you don't find in in the the literature. Um, but it is the notion that, um, you know, risk, risk that is quantified is based on an assumption of a historical track record. And, and really that is one possible path of an infinite array of possible potential paths or risk paths that um, we could face, whether it's in the future that we might never have experienced beh um, before. So we are always exposed to risk. And um, I think that where our models um, can often be superior is the way we always cut these losses short because what, what we are doing is we are, we're slowing down the, the possible ascent that the risk path can take us by ensuring that we, we, we're not getting into this sort of non-linear environment of adverse risk. So uh, we, we're keeping our risk events, we're trying to keep them linear in nature. Now, correlation is another questionable assumption because we know that correlations change and that therefore at a portfolio level can produce um, more extreme risk because this portfolio is a, a, a huge risk sponge that allows us to trade above our trading weight that we can achieve with a single model but on, in a portfolio it's it carries this latent risk in that portfolio but and that's where at the portfolio level, we still need to apply these stops and trailing stops to prevent any of those individual return streams from um, causing, you know, basically a force majeure of that, that return stream where it goes to zero. So we, we need to continuously degas our portfolio of this risk that is always in it because, um, you know, the total possible risk that exists in a portfolio is extreme, especially leverage portfolios that can not only wipe out an account, um, you know, in its leverage circumstance, you can be paying a lot more. Um, so uh, it's an interesting concept. And uh, I just know as a risk manager, you've got to be aware that you can be totally wiped out. Um, that is totally possible. But um, that's why you need these system risk mitigation me measures embedded in every trade you do. Exactly. That was beautiful. Um, that's why I kind of like use this correlation analysis in order to determine, you know, is this like the stocks, um, you know, Am I going to trade? Which stocks do I want to trade? But I'm not trusting this cor correlation. I'm not sitting back and saying, "Oh, look at me! I'm I've got it all figured out. The currencies, the commodities are not correlated." No, we've seen it. We have to be aware. We've done the best we can, uh, but things can change. This correlations they can come and go, and then all of a sudden everything goes to one. I thought I had correlation. Well, you thought you put together the portfolio in a reasonable way, but you knew. Uh, because uh, you're making money uh, from trends and outliers that have never happened before and, and fundamentals that have never existed before. So you're going to see some risk problems that you've maybe never seen before in the back test. 
you know, get ready, get used to it. That's why it's so important on day one, as Derek said, get it right in the beginning. You know, if you got it wrong in the beginning on some of these things as relates to taking small losses and trading lots of markets and your maximum risk, your maximum unit size, like what is it going to be? If, if you get that wrong, it's hard to make that audible in the middle of the play. You know, you're going to get some punishment if you trade too large and you don't have everything scored away the way you should. So I think, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience because part of, I traded as large as I, my largest risk and my most uh, um, leverage I used, you know, from day one in 1983, and then I just have gradually, like almost every year reduced that and said, oh yeah, I guess I traded too large. I'm uncomfortable. My, 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 um, my ability to, you know, to hang in there and not panic and keep trading the systems. You know, that's that's important as well. What what size risk can you handle? What's a typical day for you? You know, I need my typical day to be like 50 basis points, plus or minus, probably something like that, that I could kind of continue to maintain my discipline.